Hi, my name is Brant Robertson. I'm a professor of astronomy and astrophysics here at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I work on galaxy formation, so understanding the development and growth of galaxies over cosmic time. And I use James Webb Space Telescope and specifically the NearCam infrared camera on JWST to look for distant galaxies and tr to try to understand um, where they come from, how they came to be, and how they evolve uh, over time. I work with the NearCam science team. This is the team that built and developed the infrared camera on JWST that looks from about one micron to five microns in the infrared. We use this camera to take deep pictures of the sky, uh, very distant regions of the sky that, uh, that we try to examine and to measure the properties of galaxies, uh, especially galaxies in the very, very distant universe. As part of this, the team that I work with is called the JWST Advanced Deep Extragalactic Survey, or JADES. That is the largest program being executed with James Webb Space Telescope in the first year of observations. JWST is conducting many different, very exciting types of programs, especially for the extragalactic uh, survey realm that you may be familiar with with Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble Space Telescope took a variety of really intriguing images, the famous Hubble Ultra Deep Field that I help uh, acquire, the Candle Survey, which was a large area a uh, near-infrared survey that was relatively shallow that my colleague Sandy Faber here at UC Santa Cruz conducted. And the COSMO survey, which was the largest contiguous area that was observed with Hubble Space Telescope. Now with JWST, there are a large number of additional programs that will be executed. There is a Cosmos web survey, so this is a JWST version of the Cosmos survey that Hubble conducted. And this will survey relatively shallow with, uh, with a relatively shallow depth, a very large area, about 0.6 square degrees on the sky. And that is the largest contiguous area that will be observed with JWST in the first couple of years of observations. There are also ultra deep programs. So there's a survey called NG Deep, which will look very, very deeply over a portion of the sky called uh, Good South. It will also observe parts of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field that HST originally observed. So they're really exciting areas of the sky, both large areas that are relatively shallow and also very narrow areas that uh, JWST will be observing very deeply. James Webb Space Telescope is a, an amazing facility. It's a, uh, a very large mirror, about six and a half meters, hexagonally shaped so that it could fold up to fit in the rocket that ESA launched on December 25th of last year. Uh, the mirrors on JWST are coated, coated with gold, so that they're very reflective in the infrared, and this makes it an excellent facility for looking at infrared light. Um, the, the telescope itself is protected by a giant sun shield, which is about the size of a tennis court. And this sun shield allows for JWST to be very cold on one side, of the telescope, which allows us to have the instruments to be very cold and therefore very sensitive in the infrared. They're not glowing in infrared light. And this allows you to see very faint objects in the infrared that you otherwise would not be able to see. JWST has a variety of instruments. So there's the near cam instrument that I work with, which is the near infrared camera that looks from one to five microns. There's also the mid infrared camera called MIRI. Uh, the mid-infrared mid instrument, MIRI. Uh, MIRI looks at beyond five microns, so it's looking at colder uh, gas and dust and stars in the, in the universe. There's also the near-spec, the near-infrared spectrograph, which takes infrared light and disperses it so that you can see each individual wavelength of light uh, w one by one, and that allows you to look at detailed features in the light of galaxies and stars in the distant universe. And there's also a near-infrared slitless spectrograph called NIRIS, which allows you to take an image of the sky, but color by color, so you actually spread out the light uh, wavelength by wavelength over the whole image. And this also allows you to see the fine details of light uh, emitted by galaxies and stars. As we acquire data with JWST, 
this data comes down in, uh, in a format that needs some processing. <laughs> so um, we need to be able to calibrate the data. So that the numbers in the images that we actually see, we have to know how that translates into a brightness of the object. So we need to know uh, how to translate the numbers into physical units. So that's the calibration procedure. Each of the individual uh, images that you take with JWST cover a relatively small area of the sky. So if you want to make a large image, you have to mosaic individual pointings of the telescope. And that means that you have to register these images very carefully on the sky. You have to know exactly where they're located. So that mosaicing process also involves uh, a fairly in, uh, a detailed set of steps that we conduct. Then once we make an image of the sky in mosaic, like what you see on my screen, we want to be able to find the objects in the image. So we have to produce algorithms that go through and identify the stars and the galaxies in the image, and then make measurements uh, object by object. How bright is each individual object? And that's yet another part of the analysis pipeline. So each step along the way, people have been working, our team has been working to try to develop as best as we can techniques to accurately and precisely measure uh, the individual object properties to mosaic on the sky correctly and to calibrate uh, the data precisely. In the infrared, of course, we don't see with our own eyes in the infrared. So the colors of the objects are, uh, we, we say, false colors. So we assign, when we make a multicolor object like this, the red, blue, and green colors that you see in the image, those are assigned to specific wavelengths that JWST uh, observes with. So uh, we might say that the bluest color that JWST observes with is about uh, 0.9 microns or around a micron. This is actually further in the red than we can see with our own eyes, but when we use an RGB image of, uh, uh, of the sky, we're actually just assigning blue to be a color that is further in the red than, uh, than we can even see. Um, we might then assign, say, 1.5 microns to green and to red, maybe even four microns to give you a, a, a dynamic red, blue, green uh, color image um, that actually corresponds to wavelengths that JWST can see. The calibration procedure still right now is somewhat manual. Um, we get a, a set of data from the pipelines that have been, de been developed for JWST, but uh, the, the, the facility has not been fully calibrated yet. So each individual set of data, people are still very much in the details trying to make sure that the, the data is well calibrated. So uh, that process is still ongoing. Um, we hope that there will be some more definite set of calibration <laughs> soon enough, but this is something that people are still very much looking at. JWST lies about uh, 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth. It's very far away. So we can't actually go to the telescope to fix it. However, there are on board various types of maintenance that can be produced. So for instance, you may have heard that JWST has been hit by micrometeoroids, so small pieces of uh, space dust and other debris that have hit the mirror, and some of these have actually moved the mirrors slightly. That, if, uh, if we could not change the alignment of the mirrors, would uh, defocus the telescope. So what we do then is after these events occur, the telescope is actually fixed. It's, uh, the mirror segments are rotated and uh, moved in and out in, in focus so that the, the whole facility actually can refocus itself. And that's the level of maintenance that we're able to do with JWST. There's also a, a variety of procedures that can unload momentum of the telescope that builds up over time. Uh, there are also a set of thrusters on the, on the facility to keep it in its orbit. And those kinds of low-level maintenance operations are happening all of the time uh, with the facility. When JWST sends down data to us here at Earth, that information is stored in a set of databases which are run by the Space Telescope Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, in a facility called MAST. And astronomers all over the world, when they want to access that data, they log on to MAST and they download all of the data that their uh, observing program has acquired. So 
All of the data collected by JWST is available through MAST. Not all of it is yet public, but it will be made public over time. Some, some data is public and people out at home can download the data themselves and look at it, um, you know, just like, just like professional astronomers do uh, throughout the world. So um, uh, our collaboration, when we download our data, we of course process it on computers. And we store it, actually, some of the data is stored here locally, here at UC Santa Cruz. And then we provide it, again, these reduced data products to our collaborators throughout the world. The first results with JWST have been amazing, absolutely fantastic. The facility works better than we could have dreamed. The sharpness of the images is well beyond our expectations. And the lifetime that's expected for JWST is much longer than we were originally hoping. So there's really going to be a huge rewriting of cosmic history with JWST. On the new results with JWST, I'm extremely interested in them. Of course, we've produced some ourselves, which we think are amazing. Um, you know, of course, over time, time will tell. We will actually go in and see whether or not all of these results are reliable. We hope that they are. Over time, more and more data will be acquired. And so we'll learn more and more over time about uh, the distant universe, about these very distant massive galaxies that appear to be, how many very uh, large bright galaxies there are in the distant universe. These are things that um, JWST is saying, you know, some very interesting early information about, but, um, but it needs validation, it needs verification. And so more data will uh, really tell the story. The first year of observations with JWST, are, we're really getting our feet wet. We're executing programs. Uh, we're looking in a window of, uh, of wavelength and of sensitivity that we've never seen before with, uh, with telescopes as astronomers. So there's really a lot of exciting and new information. But I think it will take us a couple of years, probably a couple of cycles, we call them. A uh, uh, cycle is when we uh, proposed for observations and then they're executed uh, sequentially. Um, it will take us a couple of cycles with JWST to really be able to answer some of the mysterious questions the early data has uh, provided to us. JWST has a unique capability of looking far back into the distant universe. And one of the most interesting uh, topics that JWST can address is this process of cosmic reionization. This is uh, the epoch in the early universe in the first billion years of cosmic time where most of the gas in the universe went from completely neutral to completely ionized as we see it today. And we think that that cosmic reionization process was, um, was produced by galaxies, but we're not exactly sure which galaxies actually triggered cosmic reionization. We don't know if it was the bright ones. We don't know if it was the faint ones. We don't know if it was some special type of galaxy. But JWST, because it's so sensitive and the infrared light that it detects is really able to look for these very distant galaxies, we hope that JWST can finally settle which galaxies reionized the universe. Thank you.